UK election updates. What are the Conservatives doing? I'm here with Sophia Warringer, political commentator. Welcome to Rick's Europe. Thank you so much for having me. And um, so it's been said that Labour are in the lead in the polls. And if if it is so, as the polls would indicate that uh, Labour could triumph, uh, is this still the likely outcome? It is. So, of course, the only real poll that matters is the poll on Election Day, which I'm sure you'll hear many politicians say um, between now and that day, which is the 4th of July. Um, but it, the polls are predicting that Labour uh, will gain the majority of seats. However, our parliamentary system means that in order to form a government, you can't just get the most seats. You need to have um, an overall majority and more than half of the 650 parliamentary seats in the House. Um, so the, the polls will likely narrow as the campaign gets underway, as the policies get talked about on both sides. Uh, it's likely that those polls will narrow. I mean, anything could happen. We've gone into elections with parties where they have huge poll leads and then they lose them and the election result is not what most people expected. That happened to the Conservatives in 2017. Theresa May had a poll boost following the local election. She thought, this is the time to get a bigger majority so I can do what I want to do on Brexit. She went into that election and the campaign was, by all accounts, disastrous and she came back with a smaller majority than she'd gone into the election with. So anything can happen, but at the moment the polls are predicting a Labour majority. And if the Conservatives would lose, uh, what could this mean for the UK? Will people see a big change and, and a change for the better? So it is a, a big question. Uh, one that's very interesting on this is actually Nigel Farage's commentary on the differences between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. And his Take. Obviously, he has been involved in Reform UK. He's been a long-standing politician that has been outspoken on the need for the UK to leave the European Union. And his position, as he announced, he would not be standing at the election or seeking a seat um, for the Reform Party, was that there was no inspiration really for him between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. So he kind of said neither leader um, was inspiring enough for him. And it is a commentary that many people are making in that actually the policy pledges between the two parties are not very different. You look at the six next steps of the Labour Party, the six steps for change which they've laid out and the five priorities of the Conservative Party. Actually, many of them are the same. They both have commitments to stabilise the economy. We'd all love to know exactly how that's going to work. And um, that's a difficult thing to do. They all both have commitments to cut NHS waiting times. Obviously, that is a huge priority for voters. Again, that's something the Conservative Party have been doing uh, since the pandemic. And it is very difficult, very expensive um, to bring those lists and those waiting time down. They are both have commitments to try and sort out the small boats crisis, that is people crossing the channel on small boats illegally. Um, one the Labour Party through a new border force agreement and border force control command centre um, and the Conservatives obviously with their flagship Rwanda scheme. So they're trying to solve the same problems. The solutions they're coming up with are not hugely different, but of course the voters will be asked about the last 14 years of Conservatives Conservative government, not just um, the Conservative policy pledges going into this election. And that, of course, is where the differences lie. And the Conservatives are asking for a chance to seek, continue the change that they hope to be bringing in. And they, their pledge is basically things are going in the right direction. Let's not disrupt it. The Labour pledge is we need change. We need change. And really, I think when we look at the policy proposals, and obviously we have yet to see the manifestos for both parties, um, there's not huge differences in what they're proposing so far. Uh, I understand that in, in, when you look at the last 14 years, the, the turnout of voters has been rather low. Is, is that correct? And, and if there would be a, a low turnout again, how could this uh, affect the results? Yeah, so turnout for general elections is higher than what we see for local elections, for council elections, mayoral elections. Um, it will be higher than those um, 
turnouts that we've had in the last few months they are we all we don't have compulsory voting so it is never you know right up to the the top 90s but i i think what this is what we will see we will see people who are not hugely enamored by the labor party or by the conservative party and instead of maybe going out and doing a protest vote or spoiling their ballot paper or um exercising their democratic rights in that kind of way they will actually just stay at home they are fed up with both sides from in many senses of the word and and they will not vote at all we'll where i hope that people will go out and make their voices heard but i do think unfortunately a lot of the electorate have disengaged with what has gone on over the last particularly um six years since the brexit referendum there's been a lot of frustration with the political class which the people as a whole see as increasingly homogenous whether they're blue or red they kind of see them as part of that elite which doesn't necessarily take their views as seriously as they would hope so with the many people perhaps not voting in a sort of a protest, does that mean that even if the the polls indicate a Labour triumph, that that might not happen because people don't actually go out and vote? I mean, again, anything could happen. I think the most likely um, result is that, as you said, the Labour will maintain their their poll lead and that will translate into them maintaining the get getting the most number of seats i think what will be interesting is where those other votes go so those who don't vote for the conservative party and don't vote for the labor party whether they will turn to the liberal democrats who which hope to make huge gains in particular seats that they're targeting and they could emerge as a very powerful third party um and also the scottish situation as you all know the pop um politics in Scotland has been particularly turbulent over the last year or so and the Scottish National Party which is the majority and the government at the moment in Scotland is likely to cede a lot of seats to Labour and um, so there are other parties at play and of course reform and at the moment they have one MP he was voted in as a Conservative and then he's defected to reform Lee Anderson um, and whether they will be able to translate the support that they had uh, which I think is in the polls showing that it's slightly waning now into seats. As you know, in our system, first past the post, it is winner takes all. It doesn't matter if you come second in, in lots of seats, in every seat. Um, it is the first, the one with the major, most number of votes that returns the MP. So those those other votes will go a long way into deciding um, whether the uh, how big the kind of Labour majority may be um, and also how much people turn to tactical voting, whether they vote on who they think they want their representative in Parliament to be or who they or whether they will vote against who they don't want it to be. And we saw tactical voting in the local elections against Conservative candidates and it's likely that that may return with the general election. And uh, what are your views on the strategy of the Tories and uh, it this sort of sudden election set for July 4th. Um, are they expecting to win? Because there seems to be a lot of different opinions uh, around their strategy. I think the date of the 4th of July has taken lots of people by surprise. Uh, even many in the Conservative Party who are in the machinery of how it works, they hadn't selected candidates for all their seats. They still, um, as of a few days ago, had almost 200 seats to fill. A lot of those, of course, are unwinnable, but they will still field candidates in every seat. So it does seem like that was something that was closely held under wraps and, you know, kudos to the Prime Minister's close team for not leaking that information. I think in terms of their strategy, um, the Prime Minister, um, Rishi Sunak, has said that he wants to capitalise on the progress that the UK seems to be making. He has announced this general election very soon after the inflation figures came out, which are now um, reduced from what they were before, 2.3, still shy of the 2% target rate. But he is trying to show the picture of um, people feeling better off financially. And I do think, actually, whether people understand inflation and whether they feel the benefits of that reduced inflation, obviously, it doesn't mean prices are going down. It just means they are rising at a less quick rate. Um, 
is yet to be seen. I don't think people will necessarily feel better off yet. But he's also wanting to capitalise on other things, the energy price cap, so the amount of money people spend on their bills that is also due to come down. So he's trying to create the narrative of don't interrupt what we're doing because we're moving in the right direction. Whether people believe him, whether the electorate will give him that time that he's requesting to kind of finish the job is a different question. But I think that seems to be the Conservative strategy at the moment. Thank you, Sophia Warringer, political commentator, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching Rick's Europe.